Hey there, this is Lucy. If you're hearing this, that means I've gone missing. If you want to find me, you know what to do. Good luck! Another crossword. The Jumpstart franchise often went hand in hand with the detective genre. Their Mystery Club series featured the player as a detective working with one of their mascots to solve a series of cases. On the other side of the franchise, story based games were being made as part of the Adventure series, which would send you on an adventure to defeat some villain along with a cartoon sidekick. Jumpstart Third Grade is widely considered one of the most beloved edutainment games of all time. Fourth grade had its share of fans, but the original version was pulled from stores for supposedly being too scary. Boo. This brings us to fifth grade, which went in a slightly different direction than the others. Fully embracing the detective genre, fifth grade featured a noir-esque storyline with a variety of colorful characters. Unlike in the games before it, the player does not appear as a character in this one. Instead, you control a young detective named Joe Hammett, and you must track down a comical supervillain to thwart his evil scheme. Offering an entirely different approach to the Jumpstart series, can Joe Hammett Kid Detective live up to the cult classic reputations of the ones that came before it? Let's find out. After you put in your name to start the game, you're immediately met with a cutscene of a villain named Dr. X as he swears revenge on someone. Then we see a really nice cinematic shot of a city before our hero, Joe Hammett, runs away from an explosion. But it turns out to be just a dream. However, her TV's out because Dr. X blew up the TV station. So was that actually a dream, or...? We see Joe grab her skateboard and head for the bus stop in a scene that foreshadows a few future stages. She has an inner monologue the entire time. It started as another bleak day in Hooverville. The kind of day that makes you talk to yourself while riding a bus. If it wasn't for this field trip to the museum, I'd have never have gotten involved in the biggest case of my life. I just want to say, Joe has such a strong Timmy Turner voice that I legitimately assumed she was voiced by Tara Strong at first. Hey buddy! You dropped your glasses! Hey mister! Hey! Actually, she's voiced by Kath Susie, a famous voice actress known for playing characters such as Phil and Lil from Rugrats, Lola Bunny in Space Jam, Sally Acorn in Sonic Sad AM, and a million other common household roles. She's kind of a big deal. During a field trip to the local museum, Joe abandons her classmates of varying shades of blue to admire a painting. Good to know our main character has an appreciation for the arts. However, this weird scientist guy who stumbled out of the Simpsons universe bumps into her and drops a pair of sunglasses. He is then carried away by purple-haired gray guys. Such is life. We're then brought into our first instance of gameplay, but it's taken away from us when the janitor approaches and we have to talk to him. And thus we are introduced to one of the key features of this game, the optional dialogue. With every character you meet, you're given several options for what you can say to them. Most of them are jokes that don't really lead to anything, but once you dig through enough of them, you can get the story moving. According to the janitor, the guy that got carried off was his nephew, Martin. Martin is a scientist who got involved with a doctor conducting animal studies. Supposedly, they were figuring out ways they could communicate with animals. This is a fun little feature, but since you can't skip dialogue, it can get a little tedious when you have to repeatedly go through the same conversation cycle. Once you find the key dialogue that continues the story, this happens. with broom. I am BF Skinny. <laughs> Here, I got this note for you. Uh-oh. It's a Gilbert Gottfried rat. His name is BF Skinny, and he's a result of this animal communication experiment, so he can bring messages to you from Martin. His name is obviously a parody of BF Skinner, but I don't really understand the significance. BF Skinner was a famous psychologist, not an animal expert or a comedian or anything like that. Oh yeah, this rat fancies himself a comedian. I'm looking for some answers. Did Martin give you this note? He, he must have. I can't write. 
Or read, for that matter. Is that bow tie some kind of fashion statement? Yeah, I'm saying, hey, I'm a rat. I'm ready for anything. You have no memory whatsoever? None that I recall. Where did I come from? I'm a lab rat. <laughs> you figure it out. I didn't know rats went to psychiatrists. Oh, yes. We are firm believers in positive reinforcement. Could I have a cookie, please? I guess that's kind of psychology related. You have to decode Martin's message, which is in the form of a crossword puzzle. You can figure out the answers to the puzzle by exploring the museum to check out different paintings and continents. However, we have a bit of a problem here. This museum is massive. There are so many paintings to look through, it actually takes a really long time to get through the puzzle. And if you have to quit at any point, you lose all your progress and have to start it over. Honestly, most people would just look up the answers. However, some of these are actually extremely hard to find. I even found some people asking the exact questions on obscure question boards. Some of these answers are so obscure, you have to wonder if they're even worth learning about to begin with. One of the answers is even spelled wrong, and it doesn't help that that wrong letter is one that connects to another word. That's a really big mistake, not gonna lie. This process takes a really long time whether you look up the answers or try to find them in the game. It might have been better if they picked a few really important artists and had you learn facts about them. That way, the player could actually retain the information while also learning relevant facts about art. Anyway, I'm getting too critical too early, let's move on. After you complete the crossword, Joe finds a secret code that reveals the address she needs to go to. For some reason, all the addresses in the game are labeled as word and other word. Every important location just so happens to be on a specific corner where two streets meet. Dr. X is very particular about that. The janitor gives you a map and you enter this overlay that you will be seeing very often. You also have access to a progress report that tells you which subjects you suck at. You search for where you want to go, but sometimes I find myself flailing around the map because I can't find the street I need to go to. Either that or I forget the street entirely. This first map sequence is the only time the game will let you go to the wrong location on accident. Once you head somewhere, you get the skateboarding challenge where you have to avoid obstacles. It's fairly easy compared to how everything else in the game is. It'll get more challenging later. If you go to the wrong location, someone tells you off for it, then you have to do the skate mission all over again. I'm not sure why this is the only part of the game where you can make this mistake, but I'm really glad it is. To get in the building you need to go in, you have to pick a lock. However, it's locked by a series of math equations. That just might be the most effective locking mechanism I've ever seen. At first, it's fairly simple, but the format is weird. You have to type the numbers backwards. Yeah, remember that method of doing math you learned back in grade school? Get ready for a blast to the past. My first issue with this stage is that it's just math. Not a game, just math. It's on a black screen too, you don't even get a kooky character making silly remarks in the corner. I definitely have more to say about this stage, but we'll save it for later. After you complete the equations, you have to match the numbers in order to pick the lock. However, as you can see, I found myself at a loss for how to go about doing this. Thankfully, if you click on the question mark in the corner of the screen, Joe tells you how to rotate the tiles. To rotate the triangles, click on one and hit the space bar. But remember, you need to be done with all the problems first. After that intense, seemingly endless sequence of math equations, you'll be happy to see that You gotta do it all over again. Right away, both of the first major sequences in this game are more time-consuming than productive. Again, more on this later. When you get in the lab, you can talk to Martin and he drops some heavy exposition. Who is this X you're talking about? Dr. X was a brilliant scientist in the field of animal behavior who actually found a link between certain types of creatures and a neurotransmitter in the human brain that, that allows limited but effective cross-species communication. Uh, during the course of one of his ex experiments, though, he, he received a heavy dose of radioactive toast, and now he's a little bit crazy. 
Do you mean he can talk with the animals? Well, not him personally, but he's been using octopus to attain mind control over his thugs. That's how they communicate, with the octopus sending out high-frequency thought patterns. That's why you'll need those glasses, to read those thoughts. The glasses he gave you are capable of translating the language Dr. X's henchmen talk in. After eating some radioactive toast, Dr. X went mad, and now he uses octopuses as mind control devices for his thugs. Oddly bizarre, but creative. On further elaboration, we learn that Dr. X wants revenge on the companies that cut his research funding, so he plans to blow them all up. Crazy enough to force me to sabotage this electroplating factory. He has some mad idea about getting revenge on the companies that used to support his research. But, according to him, they cut his funding unfairly. So now, he plans to blow them all up. I can't believe that many corporations cut his funding at the same time. I kind of understand why he went mad. When the minions come in, you can put on your glasses to translate what they're saying. Then we get a new minigame. For this, you have to select words that correlate with missing terms the sentences ask for. They can be nouns, adjectives, adverbs, etc. They appear for a brief moment, and you have to be quick about clicking the right one. Even if you select a word that matches the part of speech it asks for, it might still mark it as incorrect if it isn't the exact word it wants. This can be an issue, but the only punishment for getting an answer wrong is that you have to do it again. The biggest problem I have with this stage is that I'm so focused on clicking the right words that I don't even bother to read what the thugs are saying. Since Jo figures everything out for herself anyway, it doesn't really matter if the player knows or not. Though later in the game, they do have this funny conversation where they try not to allude to Spider-Man. Essentially, the guards explain where they put the bomb and how someone could hypothetically defuse it. It's goofy, but it comes off naturally with the dialogue. Joe then goes to seek out the tools necessary to reach the bomb. There are three spots on the map you can visit to find the tools. It's a gamble whether or not they'll force you into a skateboarding stage. One place you can visit is Jimmy's Junkyard. Jimmy is a high-class mob member who has an interesting personality. I'm Jimmy the Shadow. Welcome to my humble establishment. What can I do for you, huh? Have you seen anything that might prevent electrocution? Yeah, a governor's pardon. <laughs> anything else? I mean, something to insulate a person from electric shock, smart guy. No, kid, I don't got nothing like that. Like with the other characters, you have to go through dialogue options until you select the one that moves the story forward. When he admits to having one of the items you need, he says he'll give it to you after you do something for him. You then get this minigame where you have to match these piles of junk to the diagram on screen. It's fairly simple, but a nice refresher compared to how hard everything else is. You can also control the difficulty by clicking the badge icons at the bottom of the screen. This can be extremely useful sometimes. The next place we can go is the mineshaft. Here we meet this lady who's strangely obsessed with organizing. Can't talk. Must organize. What work do you get done anyway? I make the unorganized organized. Your parents must be very proud. My parents do this too. I don't really understand this joke or the significance of a mineshaft worker obsessively organizing, but it's a silly character quirk in a kid's game, so it doesn't really need an explanation. Like with Jimmy, she sends you on a mission in exchange for the item you need. Even though she works in the mine, she's afraid of the dark and wants you to get three items for her. When she asks you for the items, it can sound really funny out of context. There's meme potential to be had here. I need a lava rock. I need a bison horn. I need George Washington's chair from the Constitutional Convention. The challenge itself is actually far harder than it should be. You go to different layers underground and play through this Donkey Kong-esque stage where you avoid falling rocks and look for the items you were asked for. Yes, you have to remember them. Sometimes she doesn't tell you the specific item, just an attribute of it. That means you have to read these descriptions and determine for yourself if they match. First of all, I want to get this out of the way. The rocks can be brutally unfair. Their hit detection is ridiculous and dodging rarely works. You're guaranteed to get hit at least a few times every stage. You have to go to these markings on the wall and press the spacebar to carve into them, but you get this little animation that doesn't protect you. 
If the rock hits you while you're carving, too bad. Each carving gives you a description for a certain item, and you have to decide whether it's the one you were asked for or not. You also have to climb ladders, but you have to be on the exactly precise frame in order for Joe to climb. If you're even a pixel off, she won't do it. I should also mention the rocks are programmed to follow the player, which I really don't like. This stage can be really difficult, especially your first time going through it. The last place you can get an item is at an ice cream parlor. You meet Bernie, an undercover reporter who seems to have a massive backstory of his own. Bernie? Is that you? What are you doing here? Shh! Not so loud, Joe. I'm undercover getting a story. A reporter's work is never done. So, what's up with you, huh? What can I do for you? For his minigame, you have to help him make milkshakes by matching the right measurement for each flavor. I gotta say, these are some odd flavors for milkshakes. Cool mint, limeade, cherry juice, lemonade, grape juice. I surprisingly want to try some. Still, it would have been better if it was... Ice cream. The harder stages of this game remind me that I have no idea how measurements work. Just take a look at this. I can't make any sense of it. I just switch this one to the easiest difficulty all the time. Once you have all the items, you head back to the building with a bomb in it. Then you see a worker running around and screaming. You talk to them until they tell you where to find the bomb. What are you still doing here? Union Rule 6875A says the technician must go down with his factory. You then open your briefcase to use the special items in a cutscene. I'm not sure why they needed to be selectable items if you never actually use them for yourself. Joe really does everything on her own here. Either way, once you reach the bomb, you get a minigame where you have to activate batteries to make the numbers match the one in the corner. You're being chased by these... things the entire time, but you can shut down the path they're riding if you're extremely lucky. If you mess up, you get a cutscene of the building exploding and Joe telling you to do it again. Just look what could have happened with such sloppy detective work. After you disarm the bomb, Joe goes home and writes about her day in her journal. Dr. X also yells at his minions and swears to defeat her. The next day, you're back in the museum and the Gottfried Rat brings you another crossword from Martin. Thus, we're back in yet another museum sequence. Spit in my wheels! Ha <laughs> ha! Get it? Lab rat! Exercise wheel! Go! Boy, this is a tough crowd. Okay, alright, here's the note. Ugh, another crossword. She literally said what the player is thinking. This time, I noticed that in easy mode, the crossword highlights the correct letters in green. So you can just guess randomly until you get it right. It's just as time-consuming as actually doing the mission or looking everything up. So it isn't the best alternative, but at least it's something. And yes, this means we are now going to play through everything we just did all over again. Only harder this time. At our destination, we reach a door we need to unlock with math again. This time, we multiply and divide. It shouldn't be too bad, right? Oh. That's right, it's time for the long equations. Now let's get serious for a moment. Here's my issue with the way the game chooses to teach this. It doesn't really teach at all. I always struggled with long multiplication and division, as did many others. However, this game doesn't walk you through it or anything. It just expects you to know every step of the equation. They could have made a game out of it if they wanted to take you through each of the steps, but no, they just expect the player to figure it out for themselves. I'm really sorry that I have to say this, but remember, this is an edutainment game. Where's the edu and where's the tainment? It's not educational if you're already supposed to know the stuff going in, and it's not entertainment if it's just math. That's what it is. It's just math. There's no game here or anything. There have even been a few instances where I couldn't figure a problem out, so I needed to start over from the beginning. Division and subtraction are always the second round, so if you start over, you go back to the first round. Also, if you type in the wrong remainder, you can't go back to fix it, so you have to just keep going with an equation you'll never be able to get right. Completing this can take a ridiculous amount of time where you do nothing but stress over it. How is this a game? Oh, because of the matching sequence afterwards. Yippee. No matter how good at math you are, you have to admit there's little to no education to be had if the game just expects you to know everything. 
Yes, you can set the stage to be easier, but you aren't going to learn anything. Even if you complete the level the way it wants you to, you're not going to retain that information because it didn't teach it to you. You're just going to use a calculator to figure everything out. Also, I've had instances where the game would switch itself to a harder difficulty on the second round. If you change it back, you start from the first round again. Anyway, that's my spiel on that. No game is perfect, so let's move on and see what else there is to see. You go through the translation mission again, then it's back to the same three locations. However, there's a twist now. During the skateboard sequences, the henchmen will show up and try to capture you. If you get caught, they throw you in a dungeon and you have to play this game where you stack boxes in the right order so you can climb out. This is actually kind of fun. It's a legitimate brain challenge and I always find it amusing. I wind up getting captured on purpose because I have more fun figuring this out than I do skateboarding. I still haven't been able to complete this on the hardest difficulty, but I'll forgive it. Once you get all the stuff from your three contacts again, you disarm another bomb with a cool cutscene. After this, the sequence continues yet again. I'm gonna be a little honest. Every Jumpstart Adventures game is repetitive. The formula involves going through the same series of events repeatedly until you figure everything out. In this one, it seems a little more blatant than in the ones before it. Third grade didn't feel repetitive because it had so many different missions to choose from. Fourth grade was a little more repetitive, but it still had a wider variety. In this, you just do the same exact series of missions every time. Did this one have a lower budget or something? I mean, they got an A-list voice actress to star in it. How low budget could it have been? You go through the same cycle of missions a total of six times, visiting every street corner and stopping the bomb. Things change when the rat tells you that the henchmen stole the janitor, which isn't really relevant in the story. You go through one last cycle until you reach the bomb location, then we commence the final stretch of our story. Dr. X plans to blow up the dam and flood the town, so you have to skate to it and stop him. Once you reach the dam, you have to reverse the flow of the water so it doesn't flood the city. If you click on the dam instead of the lever to change the flow, you get a very unexpected game over sequence. <laughs> Maybe I should try that again. It doesn't matter much because it sends you right back where you were anyway. When you click the lever, you activate the final cutscene that leads into the credits. Joe saves Martin and the janitor before the bomb goes off, then Dr. X himself shows up. Joe then... breaks down laughing for some reason. It isn't explained, but everyone soon runs away as the dam blows up behind them. Dr. X also mysteriously disappears, so he really didn't need to appear in the first place. Once the city is saved, we get a clip of some narrator explaining how all the characters lived happily ever after. Not sure why they're all being arrested, though. Also, just like Miss Grunkle before him, Dr. X gets away with the promise that he will strike again. Jumpstart had a serious problem with teasing sequels that never ended up being made. It leaves the story feeling a little too open-ended, but oh well. And that concludes Jumpstart 5th grade. So, what do we think? Your ears did not meet the goal. Eh, it has its flaws. The edutainment genre is one that is heavily criticized, especially nowadays with games like Baldi's Basics that exist to make fun of it. These games often suffer from either prioritizing the edu or the tainment aspect of edutainment. One often outweighs the other, so you either get a game with random educational parts thrown in, or you just get plain facts with little gameplay. Jumpstart Third Grade and Spongebob Teaches Typing are some of the few instances where both aspects are perfectly balanced. There isn't much education to be had when the game either expects you to already know something, or when it forces you to cram momentary information rather than actually take it in. Sure, in the cave mission you'll look for the key words in order to find the item you need. Sure, in the museum you'll look up the answer to the question you have to solve. But you won't retain any of this. As soon as you don't need to know something to get through an immediate obstacle, you'll forget about it. There are clearly better ways to teach than this. Jumpstart themselves have proven this. At the same time, it isn't a complete loss. The characters are fun, the animation is unique, and the dialogue is really charming. If this were to be a full-fledged game without the educational parts thrown in, it would be fairly decent. 
It would also be good if the educational parts were more like a game and not, well, just math. I really like the universe and the overall premise. It has a great setup and really feels like a 90s cartoon. A lot of people do like this game, and I don't blame them. Like I said, it's still charming and has its points worth praising. It's a step in a different direction than the games before it, and I respect that. Sometimes we have to slip before we realize the floor is wet. Thank you all so much for watching. I will see you in the next memory.